Good Saturday evening, everybody. I uh, wanted to come and bring to you a devotional message as we look toward the beginning of Holy Week, uh, a week that normally sees us gathering together as a church family multiple times throughout the week, especially on Easter Sunday. And of course, this year, we're going to have to celebrate Holy Week apart, at least physically. But we're going to be together in the Spirit. The Bible talks about the people of God being a body, a family, a spiritual house that's built together. It says that we are of one mind with the same spirit. And it's that spirit that can draw us together even as we're apart. I hope you'll take advantage of all the different creative ways we've given you to celebrate Holy Week this year with your family and together with our church family. And uh, as we look towards this week, I wanted to finish a devotional I started last week looking at Psalms 131 and 133. Psalm 131 talks about how we can connect in a deeper way with God as we trust in Him. Uh, and Psalm 133 then takes it to how can we connect in a deeper way with the people of God, the family of God. So it's like the, it's like the beams of the cross. You've got the vertical, our relationship with God. But there's that horizontal, our relationship with one another. So let's read this, and I just want to walk through this very briefly with us today. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony or in unity. It's like fine oil on the head running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard onto his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has appointed the blessing, life forevermore. It's a beautiful psalm that affirms the value of unity. And it applies to families and communities and even as a nation but it's primarily talking about the unity of the people of God. And David builds his case as to why unity is a good thing. He uses two metaphors to do that. One illustrating why it's good and pleasant for brothers and sisters to live together in unity, and then also how that unity can be a blessing for us. First, he talks about unity. He just gives a general praise for unity. He says that it's good, it's pleasant. That word good is the Hebrew word tov that we read about in uh, Genesis 1, when God says that creation is good, each day he declares it good, tov. It means excellent, useful. It does what it's supposed to do. It works right. That's what that word means. But then David also says that it's pleasant. This word pleasant is a word that means sweet. It means delightful. So unity is something that we should all desire. Unity is something that we should make good use of. It's excellent. It's, it's useful, but it's also sweet and delightful. It's, it's got a practical sense to it, but also just a, a sense in which we can really enjoy it, like you would enjoy a good meal or visiting with some friends. I'm doing this devotional on our front porch, a place we like to sit and visit with friends. But David further describes this unity, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in, human, in, in unity. Now, that when brothers live together, that phrase is only used that way one other time, and that's in Deuteronomy, where it talks about the Levitical marriage, a social custom where when sons would marry, they would bring their family to live together with their parents and would, would live with their brothers, and they would help take care of each other's families. But this psalm isn't necessarily talking about family relationships. I mean, certainly it can apply to that, but the heading in my Bible, and, and in yours as well, I'm sure, says a song of ascents. This was a psalm that was sung as pilgrims were coming to Jerusalem. They were coming up to the Temple Mount to worship and to make sacrifice. Uh, this is a time when Jews from all over would come together, and they would live together. They would eat together. They would fellowship together. They would worship together. Does that ring a bell? That's what we see in Acts chapter 2. That's the first description of the church. Think about it. It's been Pentecost. It's been 50 days since Passover. And you've got all of these Jewish people that have been there for 50 days. They're out of towners. They're making an extended stay to celebrate these two festivals. And thousands of them on the day of Pentecost become believers. And so they want to extend their stay even longer because they want to learn what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so what do you see? You see the, the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem they're selling possessions. They're inviting these out-of-towners into their homes. They're practicing this amazing hospitality. They're living together in unity 
in harmony. That word unity or harmony there, it's also a, a musical term. It means that they're singing the same song. They're in tune with each other. They're living their lives in rhythm. Unity, harmony. It's what Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17. It's what the first church demonstrated. Acts 4.32 says that they had one heart and mind. Unity is as good and pleasant as an orchestra in harmony and in rhythm. All these instruments playing the same song together. It gives us a sense of completion, harmony, peace. And David illustrates this, this unity with two things. The first one is the anointing of the high priest. is the first picture of unity that he gives us. Now, when you anointed a high priest, it was, it was costly. It was extravagant. It, this, this wasn't just uh, olive oil like you would use to cook with. This was scented, perfumed, very expensive oil. Remember when Jesus had his feet anointed, uh, the, the, the perfume filled the house. It was a year's worth of wages to, pi, to buy that perfume. Uh, Judas was angry. He said it was a wasteful act. But Jesus said, no, it's not wasteful, it's extravagant. Because true love is always extravagant. And that's what Christian unity is. Christian unity is extravagant love being upended and poured out, not just sprinkled, not just a little bit, it's being dumped out. And, and it doesn't so much, it doesn't just stay on the head, it runs down into the beard, it runs down into the folds of the robe and the collar. That oil flows and overflows. It can't be contained. It can't be restrained. It's like it's out of control. It takes on a life of its own, and it covers and saturates everything. That's the word picture that David is painting for us. When we serve each other in Christian love, that power, that testimony, that grace takes on a life of its own. It just runs. It knows no limits. If you pardon the expression right now, it goes viral becomes contagious. It goes and it passes from person to person and ends up in places you'd never expect. You know, we may not be able to be together physically, but what a testimony we can have to the world right now by being united, by showing such extravagant grace and love for each other, for our community. This is such a great opportunity. The second word picture is carries this on. He says it's like the dew of Hermon. Now, when I was in Israel, I got to see Mount Hermon. And I, and in most of the days that I was in the Galilee area, it was kind of hazy. It, they'd come out of a drought, and so there was a lot of rain. They were very grateful for that, but it meant that we didn't get some of the crisp, clear views that you might otherwise get. And that's okay. But understand that on a clear day, you can see Mount Hermon from Mount Carmel. You can see it from even uh, down by the, the Dead Sea. I mean, Mount Hermon is so tall, it just dominates the landscape of that region. And, uh, and the, the, the snow that's on top of it and the dew and the rain that falls on it, it trickles down into the Jordan River uh, through the Sea of Galilee and all the way down to the Dead Sea. Um, Mount Hermon is 120 miles from the Dead Sea. It's 9,200 feet in elevation. The, the top of it stays, stays snow-covered two-thirds of the year, and it gets over 60 inches of precipitation. So it literally is the heartbeat of the nation. It is a major water source uh, and truly a gift from God for the people of Israel. And similarly, what David is saying, it's the blessing of God that creates unity. Just as that dew fall on Hermon is a blessing on the nation, the unity of God's people is a blessing to the world. And we can't create that unity. That unity is given to us by the Spirit of God. It's like that oil that's poured on our head. It descends on us like dew. It brings God's blessing of life. And it's when we're first connected with God in humility and hope, with that holy hush we talked about last week, that's when His Spirit and that promise of eternal, abundant life begins to break down the barriers of sin in our hearts, crucifies our selfishness, heals our hurt and broken relationships, and brings restoration and reconciliation. That's how God makes us one. Think of the dew of Hermon falling on those rugged slopes. Okay, it doesn't do a whole lot of good way up there where it's so high and so cold that plant life can't even sur survive. No, it 
has to run down like the oil on Aaron's head. It has to run down into the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan well beyond Mount Hermon. God's blessings, the blessing of unity, the power of brothers and sisters loving each other, serving each other in unity, it doesn't stay with us. It spreads out and it touches so many more people, more than we'll ever know. And notice that God isn't even mentioned in this psalm here until the very last line. It's as if God is the hidden source of such well-being, like dew from a distant mountain. And so David here ends with his summary, and he talks about the power of unity. It's there where God's people dwell in close unity that the Lord bestows his blessing. By his sovereign will, God orders his grace to be bestowed where his people live together. Jesus said, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. It's where God finds true unity, that he pours out the fullness of his spirit. This is the blessing of his eternal favor. It's where we can find fullness of life, what Jesus called life abundant. So let's practice our unity, even at a distance. Even while social distancing ourselves, we can be united in one heart and one mind. Let's look out for each other. Let's check on each other. Let's love our neighbors, uh, the people walking down the street in front of our house. Let's extend that grace and that blessing to them as well. I hope that you'll join us tomorrow morning for worship, for Sunday school, and for all the Holy Week festivities this week. Uh, watch your email, watch uh, Facebook and the church website for more information. Let's pray and God bless. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be together in spirit as we are of one mind and one heart. Our heart beats with your heart, Father, to reach the nations, to reach our neighbors. Help us to do that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.